Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for, for having me. This is like really, really, really nice. I'm really honored to be surrounded by so many creative people. I feel like family. Uh, also, like I'm the result what happens when a software engineer meets a designer. They both live in my head and they have a very long, they have a very lovely time. They party all the time. <laughs> so, um, the way how I actually started with this crazy project, which is uh, called fashion technology, uh, started with the question, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Here there I was uh, in a male dominated environment as a software engineer. And uh, at the same time, I was a fashion lover. I mean, I like to dress in nice clothes. And in software engineering, I just realized there's a uniform. It's jeans and t-shirts. But I never wear jeans and t-shirts. So, but at the same time, I can kick everybody's engineer's butt because I really know how to you know, uh, fight with machines. So over the time, I was like, OK, you know, what if I want to look pretty? But like my clothes can't do anything. Or I just you know, put a lot of technology on myself, and then maybe I look like this. <laughs> so uh, this is a project from um, MIT 1990. Uh, 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 so this is real. This is not fake. <laughs> Uh, uh, and this is like Steve Mann and the gang in his like, uh, cyborg lab. Uh, Steve Mann, that's this lovely fella. But they are actually started, they were, in, they, they were the inspiration for Google Glasses. So when I started out and I was like all surrounded by technology, I got really, really frustrated. I was like, you know, I love technology. It's the coolest stuff. You can do things and can move things and maybe they make me fly one day. Uh, and on the other side, I love design. And I was like, why those two things don't work together? Because it makes totally sense, right? You know? uh, and then I was like, OK, let's do some research. And then I realized at university, the technology department faculty is as far away as possible from the creative people. Did you notice? And I was like, yeah, but like that wasn't that way before, you know, because we had like creative innovations in the past. We had innovations in the past. And since I started uh, uh, studying art history, I was like, okay, before I need to go into the future, I need to study the history a little bit. Because, you know, back then there were also some smart people who had some really great idea. So I asked the internet and said like, okay, tell me stories which can lead me into the future. And then I found the story of the zipper. Last year was the 125th anniversary uh, of, of the zipper. Uh, and it was actually, I love the story so much because the zipper was actually developed by an engineer. But it was actually made for bags, uh, tobacco pouches, and something like that. And then only just like far, far later, it went into clothing, first for men and for children, you know, so be like a little bit faster. But also like, you know, think about around that time when that zipper got developed, what else happened in society? We started to have cars, bicycles. We started to move far, far faster. That also meant we had to become far more efficient and faster. So of course, the zipper made everything faster. Also funny story, the last one who actually got a zipper were women, because it was kind of cheeky to think that like, you know, women were like far easier to undress. There is also a really funny story. Yeah, think about it. There is also, I found a really interesting article it was about that uh, shop assistants had to get trained to uh, um, tell customers about a new technology, how to use the zipper. There was a huge outcry when they introduced the zipper into the pants. Because, you know, technology, it was like kind of can hurt you. And it kind of did. <laughs> no? And people were like, oh. And then designers were like, no, this can't happen. Because nobody is going to buy my design or appreciate my design anymore. Because they're all going to buy it because of their technology. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And I was like, OK, cool. So you know, so I'm not alone. There is like, and, and it can happen. So I found the next story. Uh, Vogue, the fashion magazine, Vogue US, asked in 1938 um, a group of artists, what are we going to wear in the year 2000? 
I highly recommend make notes and look for Woke US uh, Eve in 2000. It's a YouTube video, an original uh, video from that, but they made like a little promotion video. Uh, it's, it's, it's very hilarious. Um, so uh, one of the examples was uh, this lovely man. And the interesting thing was because like what artists did, they just ignored all of like technology if it's actually possible or not. And they were like, no, like what do we actually really need? Like what would be really, really helpful for us? And that was before Star Trek, just, you know, yeah. everybody thinks uh -huh, Star Trek was, no, 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 that was the artists. This was a mobile phone on his chest. Yeah, of course, because we wanted to be reachable all the time. And then he had a little radio station here on his belt. Right? So we all have that now in a different shape, but that was already the desire. It's like, you know, the good thing is we don't need to wear the antenna on our heads. <laughs> Although it kind of looks pretty, right? Yeah. But I'm not sure if he had a lot of headaches. Right. So. Another story I found really interesting because I come from a craftsman family, so I can sew and stitch and embroider and all of that. And then like somebody told me about the story that do you actually know who made Neil Armstrong's uh, 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 spacesuit? A bra maker. And the reason was because the spacesuit, because you know, nobody had like written a book about the art and science, how to write a spacesuit. There was no university which taught you how to make spacesuits. They only knew that like we need to have very strong but very flexible seams. Who is better to make that than a bra maker? I mean, like I can imagine it's a kind of really interesting phone call. Yes, hello, your bra maker. Okay, good. Um, so Neil would like to come here over because he needs something to wear when he's going to the moon. <laughs> huh? uh, so I, I quite like that story. So, and then I was like, okay, there was nothing there. There was nothing for me there where I can actually, you know, wear something pretty and smart at the same time. And I was like, okay, good. Well, then I just have to do it if there's nothing there. Uh, I was really lucky back then in Berlin, we had like a really amazing fab lab. And I started, I started to experiment. I had a job back then, and I was like, you know, I was, oh, it's just like Nihu is so crazy. And uh, I had access to, to a maker lab um, where I learned how to 3D print and laser cut and solder LEDs. I have a thing for LEDs, lights, because light is very, very pretty. You know, because it's high, but it's high tech technology. So it's really interesting. People totally lose the, the fear of technology because light, right? For Christmas, you just like wrap, you know, the, the LED strings around you. So I was like, okay, let's, how about we start with light? And uh, I made this jacket with the sweat and tears of my hands. You know, I punched like 36 holes in this pretty jacket, put the LEDs in there, soldered it with my hands, burned my fingernails. Um, also like that jacket is from 2014, so it's never been washed. <laughs> because back then he couldn't wash LEDs in textiles. I'll come back to that later. And I was like, okay, great, it glows. So the funny thing was, is because again, I was still in, uh, uh, in a male dominated environment in technology. And uh, I went to a lot of uh, meetups, you know, for, for, for techies. And they're usually, especially when I come in as a woman, like, hello, they're like, ah. Oh. But the cool thing is because I was glowing in the dark on my back, it was a really cool icebreaker. And I'm like, oh, LEDs, this is cool, da, da, da. what can I do? And I was like, okay, this is, this is really nice. Well, okay, but we can do more. So I was like, okay, like how about we make this interactive? So uh, I, I, I did like a little internal hackathon over the weekend with a friend of mine. So and we used an uh, Arduino, uh, little Arduino. So this looks huge, but it's like it's like this, like this, like oh yeah, like here, like this, a little bit so like that. Uh, and it has a SIM card because this jacket has its own telephone number. And you can send a jacket a text message and with that change the color of the LEDs. <laughs> so you can send text message, hashtag red, hashtag pink, hashtag blue. And I was like, okay, cool, but you can also do effects. So I had like hashtag sparkle. So when you just like hashtag red, hashtag sparkle, it went like into red, like sparkled. 
or you had like fade and it goes like hmm. And the special effect was hashtag rainbow. That's why it's called, you know, and then it goes like up like this. So um, next time I'm here, I actually can, I can bring it. At the moment, it's like in the basement and in the archive. Also, it needs a software update. <laughs> that was like, okay, like, there, I'm on, there, there's something. There's like, all of a sudden, yeah, people really emotionally reacted. They're like, but it looks so pretty. And I'm like, oh, thank, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, okay, good, yeah. Um, it's like, also like talking, people talking with my back, or like also, I had like the very few women which were actually in the room that just kind of followed me. And I'm like, how can I buy this? And I was like, the cool thing about fashion was actually because like in fashion, you know, everything is about emotion. When you really, really want something, price doesn't matter. So I was like, okay, good. Um, maybe I should quit my job and try to find out what it is. So uh, um, um, I went to my husband. Uh, he's actually here. Hello. <laughs> So, uh, and I said like, I said like, you know, I can't sleep. Like this is driving me crazy. I need whatever it is, but like something is there. Like, you know, people react emotionally, people want to buy it. I don't know how to make it because there is nothing that you, you can't go to like, okay, make me like a jacket with LEDs and they have to be washable and I need a battery and the SIM card needs a software update. Where do you go? you know, when you want to make something like this. I was like, no, I have to figure it out. And I said, like, okay, I'm going to give it a year. I'm going to give it a year. And like, if it fails, then it's fine. Because the worst thing what could happen to me was like the pain of regret of like me sitting, you know, with 80 years at a park bench and saying so like, you know, I, I regret that I've, you know, I've never tried it. So I, you know, and that was five years ago, so. And um, uh, so that, then I went further into research and I was like, okay, good, you know, how about we look at fashion industry more from a like, technology standpoint of view? Because it has something to do with technology, right? And fashion, as we saw, like, is really innovative. They did, like, they used to do really, really cool stuff. So I did a little bit of research and in the Fab Lab, they had like a mobile knitting machine. You know, it's like those, those knitting machines and you have like these thingy where you just do that, like that. And then I realized, hang on, hang on, like what is that paper thingy? And like somebody told me, it's like, oh, did you know like a sewing, uh, um, embroidery machine, knitting machine, weaving machines, they all run on hole punching cards, like computers. And I was like, wow, that means I can hack them, right? <laughs> So I was like, okay, so I had like a laser cutter and a, a, a laser cutted pattern is in a piece of paper and then I just like put it into the machine and I was able to like whatever kind of pattern I wanted to do, I could make it. Because that is like at that moment, the, in, my entire world changed entirely because the thing is with industrialization is we've lost the ability to, to make things for ourselves. We've been taught when you go in the shop, this is the shirt, it's in blue, and that's what you get. Right? So I was like, no, 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 this is awesome, I can do stuff. Uh, and then I was like, well, but you know, just doing it on a little machine is a little bit, because people wanted to, they don't want to come back and like buying something. I was like, okay, I have to go to a manufacturer and figure this out. And you know, a lot of people were like, kind of, who are you? And I was like, hello. But I came back all the time. You know, one of my superpowers is, is I'm really, really annoying when I want something. So I'm just like, hello. Uh, and then I finally found a manufacturer who said like, okay, let's, let's do something. I was like, you know, well, uh, um, and they were actually really unimpressed. They were like, yeah, of course the machine can do that. I thought you wanted something crazy. And I was like, yeah, but you know, it's my own pattern. And they're like, yeah, okay, we can do that. So uh, I made a collection. So this is the pattern of the Berlin city map. And uh, uh, so it's like Ecotech standard, it's like uh, uh, merino wool, uh, it's, 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 it's made in Germany, uh, and it's also like with Shakar. So for everyone who knows Shakar, the cool thing is with those um, knitting machines is that they actually knit the negative on the other side. So like on the one side it's black and white, and then you turn it over and it's white and black. From a business perspective, awesome, you know, because I made one, I made one pattern, and then I had like the white collection and the black collection. So like, this is beautiful. There should be more out there. And then, 
Marlene Dietrich came to us. Everybody knows Marlene Dietrich, the famous singer, songwriter. Also, she is known to be the queen of light because she was the absolute master in making sure to set the light wherever she was on stage perfectly for her face. She knew that. So in 2017, we had a uh, movie production company came to us and said, like, look, this is actually like the 25th death anniversary of Marlene Dietrich. We want to make a documentary, but we want to do like a different story. And I was like, okay, so luckily in Berlin, uh, the German Cinematheque actually has the entire archive from Marlene Dietrich. It's also a little bit sad because it's locked away and nobody has access to it. Everything, what she ever wore, shoes, oh my God, shoes, um, everything was there. So we went into the archive and we discovered two letters from 1956. That was around the time where she actually changed careers and uh, was uh, um, singing in, uh, in Las Vegas. And uh, also, she was actually, besides being the queen of light, she was a really hand-on designer because she teamed up with a fashion designer and she actually developed the concept of the nude dress, as you can see here. If you remember the, the famous dress from uh, Marilyn Monroe, you know, when she sang, uh, uh, happy birthday, dear Mr. President, that was from the same designer. But like Marlene concepted it first, and in the archive you see handwritten notes because she was really anal. She was like, no, we have to do this and we have to do this and we have to do that. Because she was a showgirl. She wanted, you know, to, to pedestal people. And I was like, this is amazing. And then we found those letters where she sent letters to her designer and said, like, I want a dress which glows and is interactive. And I was like, I can die now. OK, <laughs> good. Because that was the thing. It's like, of course, you know, because she, and she, she wrote pages over pages, like very, very strict instru uh, instructions. There have to be flowers, darling. There have to be flowers. And you know, the, the, and nobody can see the light because she wanted to bedazzle people. She wanted to like, is it like now glowing or is it sparkling? And of course, every song she was singing, the light setup on stage changed entirely. So of course, she didn't have time to change the dress. So the dress had to change with her. So it had to be interactive. Funny thing was that because we were a little startup, you know, it's like we couldn't compete with any like, haute couture companies. The interesting thing was that the production company came to us and like we went to all of the big fashion designers and they all said they can't make it happen because it's electronics and textiles. And I was like, but I can. <laughs> oh my God. So we lived with Marlene for three months and uh, we made a dress. This is the dress. Uh, when you go to the website, there are lots of pictures and videos and everything. There, you can also find a link there for the documentary from um, Arte, um, uh, where you can see us, where we actually went to the machines and changed everything. But also, I wanted to explain the Marlene hole punching card. <laughs> uh, we had to develop. So this time, we worked, we worked with embroidery machines. So this is how the machine reads it, you see like all of these circles here. So this is actually the electric circuit. So you don't see any cables or something like that. And here, the bigger rounds here, here, actually super tiny flat LEDs. They come from automotive industry, you know, where else? Um, and we had to use this because this was the, uh, the instructions, the seamstress and the electrician and the software engineer had to use at the same time. Because of course we're working with electricity, so we have plus, that's the red light, and we have minus, right? So we had to explain to the seamstress, don't like make sure plus, you know, the blue is with the blue and the red is with the red, so you had to go like in the seams and everything. You know, make the connection here. And then the problem was, of course, that because when you make a dress, you, you cut textiles into pieces. But the electricity doesn't care. Electricity is like, you know, if you make a cut, I don't go any further. So we had to define a way to go from here, down here, all the way, and up. And uh, so it was a really, 
it was a really uh, a complex project. And uh, uh, we had like a team of like 10 people working on it. We, we, we laser cut it, we laser cut it uh, all of the flowers. Uh, uh, we 3D printed all of the flowers also. Um, and then like, but by hand, we stitched all of the flowers, of course pink, because she wanted it to. Right? Uh, we all uh, uh, put them together. And in the tiny back here, there's a tiny battery and there's a tiny microchip with a Bluetooth and a Wi-Fi connection. So the way how it works with that dress is when Marlene is on stage, uh, you can trigger the dress. So, you know, it has like a different light pattern. So, you know, one pattern goes like really like smoothly. Other goes like a little bit like this. Again, electronics doesn't care because it just does like what, you know, you tell them to. So the dress is on stage and you just say, light on, music please, and dress goes in three, two, one, click. Right. So that was kind of like, this was kind of like my, uh, uh, Marlene is kind of like my, my, my spirit animal. <laughs> and that was, that was like the story for us which like actually put us on the map because then all of a sudden like, oh, this is so beautiful, something like that. So I was like, yeah, Marlene, awesome. Okay, in the meantime, what actually happened is because I wasn't like the only crazy person who started to put electronics into things, variable things. Of course, everybody knows Back to the Future, right? This is like a really cool thing with science fiction. I recommend every designer, especially fashion designer, to watch a lot of science fiction, especially the current one, the Ghost in the Shell, but also like the retro Star Trek. There are so many hints what you can do with clothes when we travel to Mars, by the way, for research. Um, and, you know, because everything is a remix. Uh, so, and of course, you know, we know that like the shoes have been developed uh, quite recently, and uh, the reason why those shoes have, it took so long for the shoes to actually be made, because of course in, uh, um, in the movie it was a kind of fake, you know, um, make it until you, fake, uh, fake it until you make it kind of. The interesting thing is like what they said is like that the reason why they only can do it now is because the electronics by now got so small finally, and the batteries got so small that they can fit them into shoes. So that means, Exactly right now, it started like the last three to five years, companies starting to put really electronics for, uh, seriously into products. For instance, not, this was just released five months ago. This is the second, second generation of these Nike shoes. And they not only just tie the shoelaces, of course, you know, you have to do, it comes with a software update. Of course, it comes with an app. So what does that mean? That means that you know you, can, you always wear the same shoes, but then you get a software update and they just feel differently. It's kind of like a Tesla car, right? It's like there's like the latest update coming and said, like, ooh, now it's a little bit more sporty. <laughs> uh, and then also, of course, Google teamed up with Levi's to make a smart jacket. Think about it, a software company teamed up with a traditional textile company to make a product. And this wasn't a prototype. This went on, on the market in, in America two years ago already. Just to explain a little bit, the smart jacket is only smart here on its sleeve. <laughs> but you know, it's marketing, it's really good. So the story is that like, you know, you're on the bicycle um, and uh, mm -hmm. the jacket is connected. There is like a tag here. You can take it out before you wash it. And that tag has a Bluetooth connection. And with that Bluetooth connection, you connect with your, uh, with your, of course, Google phone. And then when you're on the bicycle and when you listen to music on your Google phone, uh, then you just go with your finger and get just go like this, next song. Or just like make it a little bit louder or like less, right? So the interesting thing when I showed it to like technology people, they're like, Seriously, I've done that 30 years ago because it's nothing new. Bluetooth is a very old technology. Conductor thread is a very old technology. And uh, uh, also the techies, they were like, also like a kind of little bit upset, you know, because like, why did nobody buy our jacket? It's like, well, because it looks shit. <laughs> 
So this is quite interesting is because also what does that mean is actually there's the power of designers, especially fashion designers, to make technology accessible. Because the whole concept of like making things pretty is not only like oh, pretty and stupid. No, 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 no. Oh. This is like making technology not looking scary and you stupid. And that's really, really important. And of course, Google, because I have one of these jackets. <laughs> They sent me that email three months ago. There's a software update for your jacket, now with new features. And I was like, ah, yeah, OK, so this is what the future is going to be. This is not about, oh, like the latest runway from Paris. This is like the latest software update from Paris. Update your handbags, update your shoes. We're used to that. We do that with, with our phones all the time. Right? So like the next thing is like in our, with our clothes. So, because that's what we are on the point, like, that's the future. It's like, what does that mean? Because if, like, technology-wise, everything is small enough that we can put it into textiles, that we also have, like, the software layer on top of that. So, like, what do we actually want to know and what do we actually need in our clothes? Because maybe did you notice when you see, like, all of the technology inspiration videos with flying cars and going to the moon for holidays, which we will next year. Um, we have a great of morning in, on Mars, right? <laughs> yeah. Did you notice that they all wear cotton t-shirts? There's no innovation in fashion. It's like, and I'm like, why? It's like, you know, because the, the, whatever kind of technology we develop, who is going to make it? Where are we going to make it? The fact, the question, what are we going to wear in future will literally touch all of us. I mean, there is a market there, right? And remember, because we're exactly in the same situation as we were in the past, we are now in a new world, in a new time of mobility. We're flying to work soon. You know, we are very independent. We are flying very often. We are moving far faster. And again, our clothes have to adapt to that. You know, we can't afford that our clothes just cover us. They have to become smarter. The question is, like, who is actually going to make it? Is it going to be the artists again who envision you know, the new concepts? And then like, technology has to figure it out how to build it. Right? So uh, one of the concepts actually uh, I developed in 2015 was actually the concept of wearable displays. Um, uh, I was like, well, you know, the thing is because you know we are moving all the time. In the morning we get dressed, but like there's so much happening from the morning where we get dressed, and then in the evening where we go to bed. Our mood is changing all the time. Our situations is changing all the time. I can't just like dress un and undress. Right? So like, wouldn't it be cool if I actually would have a garment which just like adapts to me? So like, you know, just change the color in the morning, I go like in pink, in the afternoon it's a little bit blue, in the evening I go a little bit darker. No darker. No, 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 a little bit more darker. So, um, and the funny thing is now, as you've seen, like with Samsung and Microsoft going with like the foldable mobile phones, I'm like, yes! Right? I mean, it's, it's a little bit, but, the interesting thing from a technology perspective is actually it's absolutely doable. It's just who is going to make it? Is it like the fashion designers? Because you know we saw what happened when only techies, you know, making wearable electronics. You know, uh, Steve with his gang. I don't think that's going to fly uh, uh, in the in the shops. So uh, one of the things what I always Remember, and this is one of my favorite quotes, is we are again in a time where actually the standard qualification we have from universities, from school, from the old systems, don't really matter anymore. I mean, think about the bra maker and Neil Armstrong. They weren't prepared in school. They just, there was a new thing, and they just had to kind of figure it out. We're exactly in the same situation. So that means the ability to learn and unlearn and relearn and learn again is the biggest and most important commodity we actually have in the 21st century. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Laís. Laís. I think I have two questions for you. The, the first one is, uh, what do you think is the limit between craft and design, like handcraft and technology? Like how to be unique in a world of technology and people all looking alike, just like the same, 
and uh, it's amazing what we can do with technology, but at the same time, it kind of takes away the this the individual. Yeah. The individual. Yeah. Well. Uh, uh, the limit and the barriers be between all of us should be nothing. It should just like, you know, think about it. You know, there was a time where the sewing machine was like the new cool shit, you know, and again, like the zipper. So uh, um, the, the old fashioned universities, you know, the famous universities, they, they, uh, some of them got developed around the time when like the sewing machine got developed. And then designers had to go somewhere to actually learn the new technology to make like better clothes. Has the introduction of the of the of the sewing machine uh, changed the creativity? No, because in the end of the day, it's like you know, it's not technology who makes uh, writes the story. Technology is your tool. Technology has to obey to you. And the nice thing is, it's always like that. You know, when you look at all of the like really great designs, it's always a balance between science, technology, creativity, craftsmanship, right? So this is just this is just like a new level and see it like as another tool in your toolbox. But you are the master. You decide if you want to 3D print your flowers or if you want to handcraft them or if you want to combine it together um, because the machine is not going to do it on its own sure. yet. <laughs> and the second one is uh, about the environmental question. That yeah. Means. Because you mean like electronics? Yeah. The, Thing. Yeah, so uh, several things to that also because like electronics itself as a recycle thing actually can also be like really nice jewelry. So like microchips can actually be like really pretty. So, that's, no, uh, serious. So um, the thing is like on the one side is uh, um, for instance like with the wearable displays. So this was the thing is actually like you know instead of like wearing you know getting something and then like buying it like in ten different colors, you just have like one piece because you can change it all the time. Um, the interesting thing is about the recycling cycle, and that is actually something which is already there, just in a completely different industry. So, like in Europe, for instance, there are very, very hard uh, legislations for like how to recycle electronics and how to actually make it really, really sustainable. Um, just like the textile industry hasn't thought about that, but they will have to comply, <laughs> right? So. The thing is, on one side, it's like, yes, there's always like an imbalance which we have to balance. And again, if you look back into the past, like there were so many new invention and we kind of had to adapt and find another solution to it. I mean, like, for instance, like the polyester for like outdoor clothing and something like that. It was like, oh, amazing. We just throw it everywhere. And then like, oh, damn it. It will actually outlive us. <laughs> it will, <laughs> you know. And now we're just doing a different kind of thinking. The thing for electronics, just by the way, is like that you can actually uh, make microchips, batteries, and sensors not only with like plastic, because like uh, uh, electronics fluids actually like also like work in nature. Um, this is the reason why I'm wearing like an uh, uh, an ember stone, because ember stones actually generate electricity. You know, if you actually rub, you can try that. It's like if you actually rub uh, an ember stone, ember. Uh, uh, um, uh, is the uh, um, Greek work for electro. Google it, Wikipedia, it's, I don't make it up. So like if you actually rub like a little bit of silk on it and put an LED on it, the LED will glow. So this is again about complete rethinking. This is not about that, you know, we need these plastic thingies for electronics. We just can do nature. Also, algaes grow in the, uh, glow in the dark too. Yeah. And they can are compostable and something like that. So again, rethinking. And that means you know, not going in this industry. You have to go like this. The job of a designer in the 21st century is to be a wanderer of the world and go like, oh, I'm taking this, and I'm getting this, and I'm getting this. And then you're going to sit down on the beach in Porto and drink a really nice beer and think about it. What all of that actually, like, you can put it in, uh, uh, in, in combination. I do that all the time. This is why I'm moving to Porto, by the way. It's really good for my creative process. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Não, eu prefiro o Samir. Uh, somos o Corpo Sénior da Fundação Manuel Alvada da Malta. Agradecemos muito o convite para animar este, este bocadinho. Uh, já perceberam que o repertório que nós fazemos é pouco convencional para as idades. aqui. <risos> Vamos seguir com mais dois temas, sendo que agora o próximo... Vocês conhecem, nem vou apresentar e podem cantar connosco. <risos> Sí. 
vicious fucking me. Shoot, I say, shoot, I go.